Uh, thank you very much for that warm introduction, Michael. And could I too begin by acknowledging that we meet here on the traditional country of the Wurundjeri and particularly pay my respects to elders past and present and acknowledge Aunty Joy Murphy for that uh, warm welcome to country. And can I acknowledge uh, elders and representatives of First Peoples from right across the globe. And whilst you're busy here in Melbourne, uh, there's also a First Peoples cultural conference on um, at the moment, a festival on Yarramboy. So I'd recommend in no doubt your uh, heaps of spare time that uh, there's plenty to be got throughout Melbourne. Uh, because of course, as uh, the minister, federal minister has indicated, uh, Melbourne is the world's most livable city and we welcome you here to it. I'd also acknowledge, obviously, Minister Greg Hunt, the Federal Minister for Health, Professor Helen Keller as the Congress uh, convener, and uh, obviously you, Michael, as the World President uh, of the Federation of Public Health Associations, and uh, Professor Brett Bettina Boyce for her contribution here. Um, and on behalf of the Victorian Government, it's a great honour to welcome uh, the 2,500 plus delegates from right around the world for this important Congress. Because, of course, uh, in the Australian federated system, the delivery of so much of the work that you are here to discuss in this local context falls in partnership in large part to state governments. So we look with great interest as to how you will uh, contribute to not just your global discussions, but how this is applied locally. Because this is a great opportunity to come together uh, to build and to discuss not just how we uh, can maintain and protect good health practices in local places, but indeed how we can build those public and population health systems, those systematic approaches to those many communities uh, right around the world, including uh, very close to where we uh, sit here today where far too many people are excluded from those systems, to make sure that we keep as well as make communities healthy. And here in Victoria, whilst we take great pride in our livability, as uh, Greg had indicated, and the economic growth that we've had unprecedented uh, over a quarter of a century of continuous economic growth, we know that there is much more to be done in terms of how we share and distribute that economic growth particularly around public health and population principles. And uh, part of that goes to the fact that so much of our growth is built on uh, welcoming peoples inclusively from all around the world. And this continues at a pace. By 2050, we'll be home to around 10 million people here. That's an, an increase of a further 4 million people in just over three decades. This, in raw numbers, is challenging enough, uh, but there are other factors at play here when that population growth plays through. Whether it's in general advances uh, in how our medical systems, as the Federal Minister has indicated, seek to build on the achievements to date, we know that uh, not only will there be more people, but we will all be living longer. And whilst, of course, this is good news, increased longevity means uh, all sorts of other challenges for us. And most fundamental of those is the increase in chronic disease, which will now see us uh, having a responsibility rate of 85% of Australia's burden of disease will be from chronic diseases. And that will result in nine in every 10 deaths of Australians uh, at that time. In this context, to keep our increasing population healthy, we need to do a lot better with the, many of the pillars that uh, Greg indicated, particularly when it comes to prevention. And those are the challenges that you will be tackling this week. Like most comparable systems globally, we know that not everyone in our state enjoys the same health outcomes or indeed access to those outcomes. Many groups in our communities wear disproportionately the burden of disease and their burden reflects wider social and economic disparities. We all know that the risks for chronic disease and preventable hospitalisations and poor health, poor health outcomes are correlated directly with poor education, unemployment, poverty and social isolation. These social determinants of ill health 
are, we know, concentrated in areas associated with poor employment opportunities and lower access to social services. And through these, intergenerational transmission of disadvantage perpetuates this cycle. How to tackle inequalities and break the cycle of disadvantage for a healthier future is what we like to contemplate so much of our efforts around. Like you, we must focus on these social uh, determinants whilst ensuring that the universal platforms of access to health services are of the highest calibre. And indeed, in how we deal with that will determine not just our local successes, but the sharings that you bring for your considerations here this week will help shape that. One of the key areas to ensure the massive growth that many of us are facing in health and public health and population health trends is, of course, prevention. That's why the Victorian government is particularly focused on prevention and early intervention in much of its health investment. We know from our own and from international experience uh, that what we have to do is approach this in a manner that delivers the greatest impact on those social determinants of health and wellbeing. And through this, seek to di uh, directly address uh, a re reduction in inequality and the protection of our most vulnerable uh, and at-risk communities as so as to minimise the burden of disease. Put very simply, our focus isn't on how just we can treat 10 million people by the middle of the century, it's a question of how we can reduce disadvantage for those 10 million people. It's about how we can all work across government, across the community and in partnership with our health professions and through the health population community so as to keep people who are vulnerable healthy and well. And today, amongst many, many examples that we can focus on, whether indeed, as I heard uh, Helen on the radio this morning talk about sugar, or indeed whether it's the fact that the single largest killer of women under 45 in Australia is at the hands of a um, intimate partner or a former intimate partner, or indeed whether it would be our LGBTI communities, there are, or indeed our Indigenous communities, there are so many applications of public health principles uh, that I could spend the rest of your Congress, but that's what you're here for, to talk about. I just wanted to reflect ever so briefly on two. Like our federal member, I share a passion and a recognition that the impact that mental health and its relationship to many other expressions of ill health and hardship causes across our community. Here in Victoria, we have recently launched our 10-year mental health plan to try to, uh, to try to implement a systematic approach to deal with the challenges of mental health and its wider implications across our society. Good mental health takes more than just good mental health services. This is a plan that seeks to address attitudes and behaviours, seeks to challenge stigma and discrimination and has sought to pri prioritise in particular areas of suicide prevention as one particularly challenging area. A key to that outcome has been our investments towards suicide prevention through a coordinated whole of government and whole of community support that tries to make sure that our communities and our health services reduce our suicide toll. Our most recent figures show that over 654 Victorians lost their lives to suicide. That is more than the people who lose their lives on our road toll. In fact, it's more than double the numbers of people who die on our roads. And we have set ourselves a goal over this next 10 year period to reduce that by half. Our suicide prevention framework seeks to support health services and to test assertive outreach models to better support people and their families in vulnerable uh, areas, particularly following suicide attempts. Because we know that through place-based programs where local communities will develop and lead and implement those local programs, that that is uh, essentially the application of the principles that your association has tried and tested over so many years. And I was particularly pleased to see that the federal-backed public health networks have now aligned with the work of the Victorian Community Mental Health Services to make sure that we lever off even more investment to extend that system to 12 areas across our state. 
and I welcome my colleague, the Federal Minister's priority of making sure mental health and suicide prevention uh, are a priority for him and his government. And I look forward to how we can further ensure that the principles and practices of bringing down suicide rates, and particularly youth suicide rates, can be jointly achieved. This is vital work in its own right, but it is also important in that it aligns with the World Health Organization's focus when it says, and I quote, there is no health without mental health, and I welcome the World Health Organization's theme for World Health Day this Friday, depression, let's talk about it. Uh, I just wanted to also briefly uh, reflect on, again, a global movement that we see play out in our own local community. We know that globally, the irregular movements of people is taking place at an unprecedented level, on a scale never seen before. It is confronting political and moral issue for all nations, particularly those nations that arguably have had a role in those factors that have pushed many people into this mass movement. And even doubly so for those states such as ours, where many people seek to make good their futures. These mass movements of people also raise community and population health challenges on a scale that is commensurate with that unprecedented level of population movement. That's why the Victorian Government is proud of our support for newly arrived Victorians and those seeking refuge here. We do so in a time in, across the globe when we see walls of many types going up globally when we know that cooperation between people across borders is more important uh, than ever to deal with those mental health and physical challenges of so many of those newly arrived communities and communities who are shifting across the globe at record numbers. And we know that such uh, cooperation approaches not only are more successful in dealing better outcomes for those people, but in dealing with some of the geopolitical as well as the health issues. This is where conferences like this, opportunities to display the best of humanity, where the international community and health professionals can point to the evidence and convince nations, especially wealthy and well-positioned nations such as our own, to show the necessary compassion and leadership to build better health and community outcomes for such globally displaced people, who in such relatively minor numbers, us as a nation here, go to such extraordinary lengths and at times to shun. Here in Victoria, as a sub-national government, we know that there is more we can do. We've increased significantly funding each year to provide targeted health and human services and support for refugees and those seeking asylum. We have expanded programs that include refugee health programs, specialised mental health programs, language services and catch-up immunisation programs as well as support for education, housing and other uh, targeted uh, interventions to ensure newly arrived communities are welcome and included. And we have targeted in particularly uh, those to our most recent arrivals from the Syrian refugee crisis. But what we also need to do is to reflect on this as an international challenge, not just a local challenge. And that's where opportunities like your Congress uh, challenge us, not just locally, but to take those challenges globally. Here in Victoria, we value our network of international health partnerships. We know uh, that that is essentially in a globalised world that we need globalised solutions played out locally. And we look forward to creating new opportunities for collaboration across a wide range of health issues this week. It is only by working and investing together by making sure that we tackle the cycle of poor health and social disadvantage that we can make global progress. We know that we can improve health and well-being for all of the peoples of the world and that in one precondition for how democratic and engaged people capable of delivering a better world on the back of such achievements. Only then will we be able to build a sustainable and peaceful world where citizens can engage on a planet where such rich diversity sees our mutual obligations to one another underpinned by the kind of fraternal links and cooperation that I am sure we will see here built in practice this week. Thank you once again to the World Federation of Public Health Associations 
for bringing this very important Congress to Melbourne. We wish you all the very best and we will look forward to our shared future being healthy, better and more sustainable for all humanity. Thank you very much.